The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Welcome into episode 12 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you for your patience with the delay of this week's episode. Just some scheduling conflicts between myself and this week's guest caused a few day delay, but we got it done. And it was a great conversation with my good friend, um, personal hero, mentor, Nier Z. If you're not familiar with Nier's work, it's an extensive uh, body of work. He goes back as far, I mean, when he moved from his home in Israel to New York City, it wasn't long before he landed a gig with Genesis. And then tons of studio work from uh, John Mayer's first record and Jason Mraz and um, Chris Cornell's solo record. And then he moved to Nashville and has since become first call session guy in Nashville. Um, a lot of work with Blake Shelton and Dan and Shay. Um, the list goes on and on. So this was a really fun hang. Um, there's always some some stuff I'm learning from Nier every time we talk. So we dig into everything from snare drum selection to how drum heads can affect the sound to pretty much everything. So let's dive in. Nier Z. First question, how hmm. has your work changed in the past year and a half since everything got screwed up? Is it is it different or is it similar? Is it, I mean, what is the experience um, being a Nashville session musician? I mean, definitely different. It, it's definitely, you know, it, it couldn't be any other way because everybody, everybody experienced the same shocking, you know, especially mm. in my cases, you know, but um, it started at the beginning, if we're talking pandemic, if that's what you're asking mm. me, uh, you know, that was a period of time there was uh, silent, if you like, yep. because everybody were, were questioning, like, what in the world we're going to do next? And, of course, studios closed down and so on and so on. I was lucky enough because of my environment here that I can record drums. All of a sudden, it got into a very intense um, schedule just remotely mm -hmm. recording for people remotely includes people that I usually record with them in town, mm -hmm. you know, producers that we usually go five, six musicians into the studio end up uh, doing it remotely because nobody knew. And then slowly, um, you know, again, let me just make a point here because people think, I mean, for my own, my own journey here, it's, uh, I like, I like to work with people, you know, I like to be in the studio, interact with people, playing with people. And definitely we had a period of time, which was just remotely. Mm -hmm. So you all alone, you know, you communicate via text. People don't even talk on the phone anymore. It's all <laughs> via text. <laughs> so it was a lot on my plate because, you know, you do everything yourself. Um, it's it's the truth the drumming become the easy part mm -hmm. because the engineering you know and and also guessing a lot um you know a producer usually send you something and give you an overall idea of vision and then uh you find yourself trying to cover it all so you end up playing probably many more takes and playlists Mm. that you would play if you were in the studio with a producer, because there is no one here to sit, you know, no one here to tell you like, Hey, I got it. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I know related to this question and the remote recording, I noticed that some people doing it via zoom and audio movers and there is a lot of technology which allowed us to do it in real time together and to be honest i tried once i tried and it was a disaster hmm. how come big I, I, i'll explain because i had another technical thing to take care of mm -hmm. to communicate at that time with the producer who was sitting in washington dc mm -hmm. and then 
he wants to be able to see you. He wants to hear you in real time. And then, you know, the internet glitch and all that kind of stuff. Even though that I changed it since then. I mean, since then, I got my own router. I got my own internet provider just for my studio. <laughs> so I'm sure it's going to be much better. But it just was too much on your plate. Mm-hmm. You know, because like I said, the engineering, it's just to me, um, that's the next stage. I need to train myself, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I need to train myself to deal with another factor, which is communicating with another person in a different town, you know, like we're doing right now, but Mm -hmm. I don't need to play drums right now, (laughs) you know, and make sure that everything is... Um, anyway, so at the beginning, yes, we, we did a lot of remote sessions and then slowly, slowly, uh, some producers, some record labels made a decision to, okay, let's start putting some sessions together like we always have in Nashville. And then we got into a routine where we had a medical team. You know, the record label will hire the medical team to come to your house and test you for COVID-19, test you 24 hours before the session. Um, Even though we did the test, even though you get the negative results, which is good, you're still wearing a mask. You know, everybody keep the, you know, keep social distance in the studio. Uh, For a long time, we avoid leaving our station meaning instead of me you know we play a take usually everybody's going into the control room to listen everyone stayed in their station and Mm -hmm. you listen back with your headphones you know um and you can imagine it's difficult to because it's all different it's a whole different dynamic you're so used to interact and you walk into the control room and you want to listen back and hear what is a day here and all that because it's always different between the monitors you know in the control and your headphones in the live room and so on and so on so excuse me we pretty much managed to to do that and to be honest we did quite a lot we end up uh when we look at 2020 we did a lot of recordings yeah, it seems like it. it. It really, I mean, we got lucky. We really got lucky because at the same time, many of the artists, I mean, nobody, no one performed. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, so those guys who are so used to be on the road, it's like, well, I'm writing songs, so I might as well go in and record them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what was going on in New York or California. I mean, it was a mess everywhere. But as far as the recording, everything uh, pretty much uh, kept kept us busy. You know, it wasn't fun, Mm. to be honest. It wasn't fun because this unknown, this old vibe was weird. Come on, mm-hmm. you know, everybody knows that. So that's pretty much it, you know, and who knows? We'll see what's going to what's going to happen now. I know people is going people are going out. Um, is the session scene now a little bit more normal? A little bit more normal because there is so many more people who got the vaccine, mm-hmm. you know, so there is less fear, you know, um, uh, people, yeah, the majority, I would say, got the vaccine, um, which I personally recommend, as you know, because COVID-19, to anyone who listened to us who doesn't know, almost killed me, Yeah, you literally. Got sick. Yeah. Three months ago, I was on ICU, and I just didn't get a chance. I, I, did, I couldn't get the vaccine at the time. It wasn't available. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like I didn't want to. Um, but it definitely feels more open and more relaxed for now. Who knows? You know, they're always talking about there's a new variant going on out there, you know, and, yeah. 
and all that stuff. I know from some major artists that I worked with uh, recently that they were selling tickets, they back on the road, but they had to cancel a few shows already. Mm. And the reason is that some places around the States, um, they didn't sell enough tickets. Not because people don't want to see them, because people are still afraid. Yeah, that will take a People while. still don't feel comfortable to, you know, uh, get together between 20,000 people in, you know, in one venue. So... Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the overdub world because you're mm -hmm. talking about having to do, you know, wearing all these different hats. Does that, did that force you to not experiment as much with maybe your setup, just keep a setup going and use it on everything? Uh, you know, but that's a, that's a great question. I wish I could be this way. Mm. I cannot help it. You have I to. cannot <laughs> help it uh, I, because you know, it's very like in many times, you know, yes, I could keep the same setup and kind of make it work. Mm -hmm. But to me personally, it's very hard sometimes to like you play a song, you start to experiment and learning the material. And then you realize, you know, shoot. I know that this right symbol or this hi hat will work much better for the song. I know that this snare will be better, and I know that this bass drum <laughs> will be better. You know, and and just for example, you know, you record anyone yeah. who who record drums. It's just the nature of this instrument. <laughs> really, you replace the bass drum. It does. It's amazing. It doesn't matter. It always blows my mind that, you know, you keep the microphones. Everything is the same. You're literally replacing the bass drum. Everything sounds different. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and and therefore you're going, you're going through another journey. You find yourself spending another hour. Yeah. <laughs> of kind of placing the microphones slightly different, you know. It's not only the bass drum microphones, it could be the room microphones and it, it's just a, it's a chain. It's a chain reaction, you mm -hmm. know? So yeah, I mean, my dream, I wish I could have like four different setups kind of ready to go, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it, it's not exactly like that. I'm not keeping like exact same setup all the time. You know? When you go to change a bass drum, is it, is it size you go for a smaller or a bigger drum or it could be a smaller size it could be a bigger drum it could be the same size bass drum it just you know that this one sounds slightly different it could be a different drum heads combination mm -hmm. yeah you know so it, it really depends i mean i got two identical bass drums here that you know if one of them has the in my case, it's the Evans, you know, the EQ4 mm -hmm. clear, which to me was kind of the, the all around kind of bass drum sound versus the Cuffton 56 mm -hmm. on a pretty much identical bass drum. It's a completely different animal. It's a completely mm -hmm. different sound, you know, so it varies. It really is, you know. It can be just a different drum head on the same exact drum and it, it's a different sound. So, um, I, I cannot help it to be honest. <laughs> I'm just one of those guys and I know you're probably the same, you know, you hear something and well, I'm not going to cheat here. You know, it's like, yeah. it's not like, Oh, you know, we're going to fix it later. We're we going to EQ it and we're going to manipulate it or whatever. Uh, my goal is to get, always get the drum sound good, as good as you can get them to sound. Complement the song, complement the music. Mm -hmm. And sometimes eh, it's a pain, but you need to replace, you know, snare drum. It's a bit easier because we usually 
yeah, you know, you take one snare off, you put another one. Even though when you replace the snare, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's always amazing me. You just put a different snare and the old drum set sounds different. <laughs> right. right? So. Do you have a starting point? Like when you call, when Cartage brings a kit to a studio, what do they set up first? They always set up, in my case, um, I let them know ahead of time. The way we work here, which is a great system, um, every Friday, in my case, it's uh, Drum Paradise in Nashville, which they're awesome. They're very professional and, you know, all legit guys. They know, they know drums, mm -hmm. you know. And related to the projects every friday i'll give them the schedule for the following week okay now when i give them the schedule for the following week most cases i know the producers i know the artists i know the studios and i know what is it they're looking for mm -hmm. so uh, we always as far as set up as far as the drum set it's always just uh you know, my setup is very simple. You know, it's it's uh, it's um, kick snare, one rack tom, a thirteen inch rack tom, sixteen and eighteen floor, and then I can make a note in this session. Please set up the twenty two inch bass drum and have the twenty four available in case I need it. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, even though I have, I'm playing a 13 inch rack tom, I have a 10 inch and a 12 inch available as well. This is mm -hmm. in case, whatever, you know, there is some music, some songs that required more notes and stuff like that. But this is the basic kick snare, rack, floor, floor, ride, couple of crashes or three crashes, you know. And um, and in my right now it's the vintage series, the Sono vintage series. It's been like the to go, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I got the SQ one and the SQ two. They're a bit more, uh, I would say, they're a little bit more rock sounding, a little bit bigger and more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll make a note if that's what necessary. We're going to set up this this drum set. Uh, as far as the setup, it's the same setup. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the configuration. So it's not that complicated. As far as snares, um, uh, let's start with the cymbals. I've been a Sebian guy for many, many years. Mostly it's the artisan. Mm -hmm. Artisan cymbals. This is my to-go setup. I got plenty of other cymbals. Again, depends on the on the project. It really is, you know, that's a great example. Um, if I end up playing something that it's a bit more heavy, guitar heavy, electric guitar heavies, you know, that you kind of need to cut through, you know, so I might replace the crash symbols instead of the artist sound would be the AAX, mm. the symbols, you know, they're a little bit punchier and a bit more aggressive. Uh, related to the hi-hat as well and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as far as the snare drum, believe it or not, it's, it's uh, why wouldn't you believe it? It's uh, one of my favorite snare drum became the, the vintage series. It's really the matching snare for this kit. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time in my entire career that like the matching snare, you know, so there is a, something come up on the screen you know it's just one of the most versatile snare drums i ever played even Which though size? it's a wood it's a it's a five and a half i can show you i mean this is like this is one example that's uh i believe it's five and a half by 14. yeah that's your starting point for everything it's starting point i mean this one all depends um there is a snare uh, that I really, really, really like. Uh, I started using it in the last few years, which is the, man, that's the Steve Smith signature snare. Chrome it's over a, brass? 
Yeah, it's chrome over brass. It's five and a half by 14. Very straightforward snare. Has those diaca stream. My only, um, I mean, the only downside, you know, the tension lugs, you still need the old school. Oh, the screwdriver thing. The screwdriver <laughs> thing. Um, so what would make but, you pick one of those over the other? Um, the 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 just all around sound if you like i find him and and again listen we change over the years we we change mm -hmm. you know like in, in this in i find out that in the you know when i'm talking the steve uh, steve smith signature snare there is something that is very classic about it it's like old school snares you know not necessarily vintage sounding snares it just just a good sounding snare though, mm -hmm. you know, that would give me a great reference when we start playing a song, a uh, very versatile with the tuning. So it's not like one sweet spot where the drums sound good. You know, there is snare drums like that, mm -hmm. that, as you know, um, oh, you know, this snare drum, you, to me, it's just like, has, and I guess the simplicity of the hardware and everything, it's just simple. Mm -hmm. You know, the throw off, our old kind of classic throw off that stay tuned and it's just something very convenient. Um, because there is snare drums that are very, they are very particular, you know, and to me, to start with those snares, they sound amazing. Don't get me wrong. It just, uh, I'm trying not to confuse the engineer when we do a sound check. Mm -hmm. you, you know, in this case, like those two snares, for example, I noticed that from the engineer point of view is getting a good sounding classic snare drum sound, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we still use the, I'm still using the Black Beauty like everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, but there is many snares who took over the Black Beauty, uh, you know, happened like this week happened with Blake Shelton on Monday. You know, they said, okay, that must be a Black Beauty. I put a Black Beauty, but then I put the copper, the, the, the bronze, the sonor bronze. Yeah. And it killed it. I mean, it was like engineer pressed the talk back, right? right don't change a thing, <laughs> you, you know? Now I know it's an expensive drum. It's a very fancy drum, but anyone who played this drum noticed that there is something extra you mm -hmm. know, about this one. Um, Do you tune them and, all similar to start? Yeah, usually medium, medium high, I would say. And then what? Medium end? high. I'm, you know, it's been for a while. I'm changing. I'm not changing really. Depends on the snare. It's either the UV1 coated, mm -hmm. the G1 coated, or the G2 coated. You know, I'll give you an example. I got one snare of the vintage series that I have the G1 coded on it. Mm -hmm. And I find it uh, a great combination for, especially if I need to play brushes or hot roads, hot roads or any of those lighter sticks, lighter sound. Um, it's just kind of happy marriage, mm -hmm. you know, between them. Um, um, I kind of feel it. I don't know. You know, sometimes you, you look at the drum, you touch the drum and like, okay, I think the G2 coded going to be, you know, going to work on this one. It, it really is, you mm. know. So which drum has the G2? The G2, like for example, the, when I go to a classic sound, like, there is an example. That's another. That's the vintage. Mm -hmm. Has a G two coated on it. So it has a UV one on it. Uh, there so is. What does the UV one uh, give you? It's just the single ply. It's just the classic single ply. 
mm-hmm. uh, really. Um, um, it's just a classic single ply that lasts much longer than the the regular the classic single ply. Mm-hmm. You know, they, I don't know what they did with those drums that, hey, with those drum heads that actually, whatever the material is, they last much longer mm. and they're very so, easy to tune. So if you're hitting a little bit harder, you'll go with that one? I'm sorry? If you're hit, if you're playing harder? Yeah, if use... I'm playing harder, I mean, yeah, if I play, if I, if I, if I play sticks and I, I play relatively harder, I'll go with the UV1 or the G2s, mm. you know? Um, it really depends, um, like behind me, I don't know if you can see behind me, there is a vintage series mm-hmm. set up like right now on this one, on this kit, it's all G2 coded. I have another one here set up, has all the UV one, um, coded. Now it's, it's, I find this is my own personal taste. Like if I go to a lower tuning, I will probably, I'm using the G2 coded. Mm, Okay. Something about the material is a bit softer. If I'm going to slightly higher tuning, a little bit more crack, if you like, I'm using the UV one. Okay. It's very subtle. It's very subtle, but it's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. You you, you know, there is so many options. It's not really right or wrong, you know? (laughs) Um, I mean, I have some other crazy drums that, you know, I got a special kit here. We talked about it. I got the concert toms by, oh, the, right. you, you know, with hydraulics. Got the I got it. I put the hydraulics on, but now I got, I'll show you a drum. Okay. Uh, show you one drum so you can. You see, look at that. That's the baby. That's the eight inch. That's cool. <laughs> look at that. And this one has the the black chrome uh-huh. on it, which I find a killer combination. You know, uh, this kit goes from eight, and, and the entire kit is uh, concerton, mm-hmm. include the bass drum cool <laughs> everything yeah it's a it's a 22 inch bass drum and it goes from eight there is eight 12 13 14 toms and then there is a 14 16 floor toms all um concert toms this is still kind of a secret so not even supposed to show it but <laughs> i did <laughs> has you that know? left your studio yet no didn't yeah i i used it I used it. Um, actually, did a track for a friend, for Den and Shay here. Mm. Then I actually used this drum kit. I had that. You know how to describe it? Almost like a kind of funky islandy kind of track that you, you can definitely hear it. I'll I'll let you know when this song comes out. I don't think this song, you know. I mean, the record just came out, but I don't think this single is still out mm. there, you know? So I had the privilege to use this set, you know, as far as Sono, they didn't decide it, what they're doing with those, mm. this approach, you know? Now, um, you know, snare drums, uh, or you can go ahead, ask me questions because snare drums, it's a whole other, you know, it's a whole yeah. full topic, you know? It's well, like, what's, um, what about muffling? the snare drum do you start with any or do you not i depends on the drum okay because i unless any other drummer out there can show me a trick if if the producer asked me ahead of time he says to me i really want a deep sounding snare for this song just an example Um, to me, and it doesn't matter, it's a wood snare or metal snare. When you tune it really low, there is no way to get away without doing some muffling. Mm -hmm. 
that it's just the nature of the drum. When you tune the drum head so low, you get all those overtones, you know. Uh, so it really depends. I'm using different, different things. Like guff tape, like everybody else, there is something about guff tape that always works, mm -hmm. you know. All the different type of moon gels. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to make it easy, I'm a big fan. I can show you one. Let me get one so I okay. can show you what I'm talking about. Got some secret there weapon go. here. No, it's not. It's not really a secret weapon. I mean, people do just the classic towels. Now those, these are the ones. If I'll open it. Oh yeah, it's like a shop rag. Exactly. You. I don't know how much you can see it. I get. Yep. You know, you buy this at Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> you get a bag of it. There is red ones. There is yellow ones, I believe, or maybe some other ones. But for whatever reason. It's something about the red ones <laughs> that they breed more. I mean, you can almost kind of see through a little bit. Okay. A little thinner, maybe. Yeah. And you know what? There is something about these that really works well. You know, I sometimes I, I, I cut it different sizes, so I don't need to, you know. And you just put it, uh, you know, depends on the, give you an example. I can do this. Yeah. It's right. Like a two inch tube. Like of. two inch. Yeah. And I put it on the edge of, if we're talking an 18 inch floor tom, 18 inch floor tom, that's a big drum. Mm -hmm. You know? So I put it on the edge and I test it and kind of find the sweet spot and then just put, you know, to, guff, you know, pieces of guff tape or whatever, just to keep it in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about on the I snare? Mean, Use that on the snare drum? Same thing on the snare, mm -hmm. but same thing on the snare. If you look at this old thing, you can cut this much, like, you know, become like two by two or four by two. And you kind of put it, it, it does change the sound. It's mm -hmm. sonically to my ears. I mean, maybe people disagree, but to my ears, it just sounds different. So you hear the difference between that and like three moon gels? Yes. Okay. I wonder what it is. Yeah, is it I don't know what this maybe is. Maybe is it moving when it, you maybe, play? Yeah, maybe it's the fact that it's moving a little bit, you know. Um, it's obviously going to sound different. The drum become different. If you take three moon gels and spread them around the drum, yeah, you can get to whatever, a sweet spot where you like the way it sounds. But when you get this much just on the edge of the drum, I think there is something, uh, the overtone is more even mm. all around. I'm just trying, I'm trying to analyze it. What is it I hear different? Yeah. All right, so but Moon Gel, a, if you're listening, we need big four by two inch pieces yeah. of Moon Gel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but there is something about the towel thing that still, you know, still really, you know, we're talking about a snare drum. I'll give you an example. There is one snare that I have in my arsenal over there. Um, it's like seven, I believe it's seven by 14. Mm -hmm. It's Allegra, the Allegra drum. Oh yeah. I it's a those. very thin shell with wood hoops. Um, I tried this particular drum. It sounds amazing when I tune it really low. It's like what I call the, the tomato, the, the potato bags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I probably put that much of towel, you know, on yeah. the edge of the drum. So there is really no overtone. Uh, um, you really got to play it dead in the center or kind of a bit off the center. Otherwise, it sounds terrible. Definitely mm -hmm. when you tune it so low, you don't hit it with the rim, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know. It's like every drum has his you know, has his own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it's just the nature of those drums. Um, 
What about got, the uh, the Steve Smith drum? Do you keep that more open? I keep it more open. Actually, that's a great example for a drum, and I think the reason is the reason in this particular drum um, is the diecast rims. Mm, okay. So there is more control. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is a drum here. I can show you. It's not the Steve Smith. But that's the, that's a high end brass, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sono. Um, it's just the pro light, you okay. know, heavy. I don't know if you can see those are diecast dreams yeah, as well. Okay. Those are the classic heavy, you know. But that's another drum. I can definitely look how much moon gel on it. Oh, that's a moon gel. <laughs> Uh, it's like a, do you see a, the size it's like smaller than a postage stamp that's tiny. yeah <laughs> but it this tiny on this drum makes a big difference okay it just it, when you actually play play it, it it just it just balanced the overtone just enough and and i truly believe that if i had the triple you know the the flange the classic rims on it I, I probably would use more mm. a moon gel or whatever. Yeah. You know, but again, a drum with a die cast streams, especially those ones, the sonor ones. They look big. They, yeah, they like very, you know, heavy duty. Mm -hmm. And, and they, it makes sense to me. It makes sense because it kind of balanced the drum almost, you know, perfectly to the sweet spot where you wanted to ring just enough, mm -hmm. you know, um, there we have the, I think one of the greatest men, I hate to get out of camera. Is that okay to grab Go the for it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry guys. Whoever watched <laughs> that. Now take a sip of water here as well. Yeah. We can spy on what you got in your studio there. See some bongos in the corner. Oh, there's a lot going on in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta steal that. I got bongos. I got I got drums. I got. Uh, but talking snare drum, and I'm sure you've seen this baby. That looks like the Benny Greb signature drum. This is Mr. Benny Greb. Let me. Can you see it? Yep. Well, I gotta say. Uh, this is my own opinion. Over the years, we've seen so many great, you know, cool snare drums, signature snare drums, artist snare drums. Now, they're all good. They all sound really good. Mm -hmm. I got to say that this guy definitely went the extra mile mm -hmm. because it's pretty amazing. The, the system, you know, we're talking about the, the dumping system, first of oh, all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's on a slot. Yep. It's, it's pretty amazing. And I use this drum quite often. Oh, that's you know, a 13, that's a, right? That's a 13. It's a 13. But it just, there is a, a combination here, I guess, the shell, the hardware, everything they've done that um it's pretty amazing and very versatile tuning wise mm -hmm. you know very versatile and this drum never seen a guff tape or a towel or a moon gel or uh because that was a that really that really impressed me you know the, i don't know if you can see the system yeah it's like a slot i know you've in. seen it yeah. but having those two dumpers in internal ones um and you know what and it's and it and it stays it doesn't change while mm. you're playing you know so that's another drum that so what would be your cue to get that drum why would you put that one up for uh, a song what, what, say it again what what would what would make you use that drum instead of the vintage drum or the Steve Smith drum. Why would you pick that one? It's, you know, it's an instinct. Hmm. It really is. 
it really is an instinct. It's just something that um, um, I can't really point out. It's uh, and it's not even something to compare to. You know, we're talking guitars, for example. When you play a guitar, an example, I know the guy, you know, you you pick up the Telecaster or the Stratocaster, you know, there is a very different, it's a different sound. Mm. With the snare drums, to me, I mean, there is some snares that it's definitely very different, but this one, let's say, if I'm looking for something that is a bit more, I would say more controlled. It's almost, almost be able to separate the snare from the drum set. Mm -hmm. I know exactly if it what makes you mean. sense. Yep, I you know, know what I mean? mean? Yep. It's like when you play a 14 inch drum, especially if it's a, if it's a metal drum, it, it's very demanding. It's kind of, it takes over the entire drum kit. Mm hmm. You notice the drum, you can feel the drum, you can hear the drum even when you play the kick and the toms and everything else. Um, this one has, maybe it's the size of the drum is, you know, has to do with it. Kind of has his own zone, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I'm there and I'm not interrupting with the rest of the drums, mm -hmm. if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, not all the snare drums to me are, you know, I'll give you a completely different example that I find out, you know. Uh, so here is that, right, that I think as a modern drum, it's it's one of the most versatile drums I've played, okay? But, you know, when you change a drum, look at this guy. Oh, you see the towel, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? So it's kind of, it kind of touch doesn't, touch and doesn't touch it yeah that's a 67 that's a 67 jazz festival mm -hmm. okay classic now classic drum but this drum for example for my opinion i mean this drum can take just as much what mm -hmm. do i mean by that there is a threshold you cannot cross if we're talking modern drumming, if we're talking, you know, a bit heavier drumming, there is a threshold you cross with this drum that from sounding beautiful, classic, wood, old school drum, it can sound terrible. <laughs> but if you overplay it? Because if you just, if you hit it too hard, uh -huh. It's the shell, it's the it's the hardware, whatever this is on this drum, to me, it just doesn't take it. Mm -hmm. You know? And and um, the reason I mentioned that, the reason I show this one, because it's, uh, it, it, you gotta be aware. You know, if I'm talking to younger players out there who, who kind of starting with the recording and, and, and all that stuff, uh, you know, to me, as a it, it, this look at the sh I mean, it's almost mint condition. Yeah, it looks brand new. Yeah, it looks like brand new. You know, and I find this on eBay a long time ago, and I actually, I paid good amount of money because I had to be fair. I mean, the guy, I remember whoever it was, it was very nice. It was like this. That's mint condition. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you deserve the the payment. You know, and uh, I do have the drum set actually. Oh, cool. Yeah, I have a drum set, a 67 classic, you know. Does it ever get used anymore? Sometimes, here and there. Here and there. You know, when people particularly ask me for, you know. I actually used it not long ago with uh, producer Ron Fair. He wanted a real vintage sounding drum set, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and everything in the production and everything around it was, I uh, can't even remember who was the artist, but it was very, just very vintagey. Everything was ribbon mics and, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
because again, it's it's those drums. By the way, I noticed that those drums they won't get as loud as the sonor kit. Mm-hmm. I mean, they can get loud. You can hit them hard, but they sounds like crap. Right. You know, there, there is that threshold you cannot cross where it just doesn't sing anymore. Yeah. The modern drum sets are more forgiving. You know, they have more headroom. I don't, it's the it's the newer wood. It's a different maple. It's it's the hardware. It's all that, uh, all that stuff. You know. Um, so again, there is like um, I'll give you another example. Oh, that's the Slingerland. I know that drum. Did you bring that with you from New York? Yes. I know that yes. drum. That's the. You know um, that. Yeah. That's a great drum. That man. This one is from the early seventies, I believe. Yeah, I don't know what they called that. Was it a Gene Krupa? It's a six snap by fourteen. It's it's the it's like the Gene Krupa, but a six and a half one. Mm-hmm. You know. And, and again. I don't know what this is, and maybe if there is a drum expert out there who can kind of, you know, even though this guy, it's a, it's a metal, it's all metals, you know, and it's a great sounding drum, but you, again, if you cross this threshold, if you hit it too hard, it just doesn't sing. Mm anymore versus a new chrome over brass snare drum that you buy at the store right now for whatever reason i don't know what this is maybe it's the material mm. you know i just don't know um but this one has a, just has that sound you know that's why i never got rid of this drum you know because it's just also there is a lot of a lot of memories this drum actually you can hear it uh, many years ago when we made uh, Superior Drummer. This, That's what the, I the, yeah. Yeah, it's I've there. I've used your samples on dozens of records. Yeah. And, of and this, drum. Drum, <laughs> this drum is there and it sounds great. That's very drum, you know. And by the way, this one is bent. I don't know if you could see. He fell. He literally he <laughs> fell. I think they all to be see. bent. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely you know so when would you pick that sucker out of the you know the collection like what would, what would make you pick that drum for a track instinct <laughs> it really is an instinct um sometimes just a search you know sometimes and you know we didn't scratch the surface because snare drums as you know hey how many more snare drums do you need Right. Yeah. I always said just one more. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an addiction. I mean, we, you know, there is much worse addictions than that. Yeah, Every, yeah. I mean, do you, have you ever met a drummer out there who doesn't like snare drums? It just, N- I know they've across... really getting into it. I've had a few who don't know, like, I just have a snare drum. Well, I'm like, all right, well, wait till you get your next no, one. No, I and respect your next that. <laughs> but, but when you get into it, when you get into it, I mean, I know that, um, you know, snare drums, it's just something that we just love it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, to me, it's like, I love microphones. You know, I love to hear, you know, uh, different microphones and and experiment, you know, and and experience the the sound, you know. To me, it's it's fascinating. It's just like, you know, take two different microphones and put them in the same exact spot, mm-hmm. and hear what this guy is picking up and what this guy is picking up. Especially if they're supposed to do the same thing, you know. In my case, I mean, take a Coles ribbon mic and take an AEA rib on mic put them in the exact same spot and hear the way this guy sound the way this one sounds snare drums it's the same thing and 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 sometimes again sometimes it's just an instinct you know to you're going through a journey it's like you're looking for this one drum 
but also, and I'm probably, I don't know if we get to talk about it during the clinic, there is a huge different, I'm going back to dumping the drum for a second. Mm. Okay, and that's really important. Because in general, to me, especially as someone who's doing a lot of the uh, mainstream commercial recording, that in 85% of those productions, it's always involved samples and programming and so on and so on. The old drum set approach become completely different. Meaning, if I'll take whatever, this sono vintage set right now, no dumping, no nothing, and I'll tune it, most likely you're going to sit behind the kit and play it and wow what a joy Mm -hmm. you know but when i'm in the studio and once the producer hit play and play me and play us the pre-production the programming he created already and all the elements uh, most of the time i need to retreat the drum set completely different Mm-hmm. You know, so if we talk in studio, that's a whole different animal. An example, uh, just a classic example, if there is some programming going on and I'm supposed to be the extra layer on top of it that, let's say, kind of lift the song. I, let's say acoustic drums comes in in the chorus. Mm-hmm. Um. You need to be aware that any of those snare drums, now it doesn't matter. Let's say we, we picked up the snare, we like the tone of the snare, but if you keep the snare relatively open, there is a ring going on. What happened that it doesn't matter, every time you hit that drum, the overtone is going to be slightly different. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Underneath, there is some samples and instrument that don't change. Right. Yep. And then it become there is a bit of a fight going on between the overtone of the acoustic drum and the samples. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you'll find that in, in many cases, you're going to sit behind my drum set and thinking you're going to play the snare and it's like, wow, it's completely dry. You, you know, and if you just play the drum set and if we just play the song acoustically, organic kind of band session, I might keep it open, but when there is so much samples going on and programming going on, you're going to find a lot of dumping and pieces of towels around the drums, snare drums, the blanket Mm. on the bass drum, the towels on the toms, you know. Um, So it become a whole different approach and it's something to be aware of. So to me, it's almost two different instruments. It's like, if I'm making a record, if I'm playing with a, a bunch of musicians now and it's all organic, when I mean organic, doesn't have any of the uh, programming stuff and loops and all that kind of things, that gives me more freedom, gives you more headroom for the drums to sing and be open. And that's the beauty of it. The overtones are slightly different in different sections and so on and so on. But when there is such a a particular production and everything is, you know, there is a signature sound going on, you need to match it. Mm -hmm. And most likely you want the first chorus and the second chorus and the third or whatever to stay consistent. You you know, because you don't want the snare to sound different. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, if you want to, it's not right or wrong, but, I'm being realistic related to the modern production, you know. Um, Does that also come into play the way you 
you play the track? Are you being yes. very, way more particular about very precision? particular? Trying to trying to be more as consistent as I can be. You know, as consistent as I can be while I'm playing the song. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the movement. Things will happen. I would say in my case on top, like hi hat can be, you know, dynamic accents and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But when we talking, just when you play a backbeat on top of an existing production, and again, I just, you know, the producer is telling you, I need you to lift the chords. So I'll try as much as I can to stay as consistent as I can, for example, with my bass drum and snare back me. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I mean, again, it's a different instrument. They become a different instrument that you might solo the drum set and it won't make sense to you <laughs> in a way. But when you play everything together at the same time, you're going to get the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And it really is, I mean, I couldn't even tell how to, yeah, I mean, you can practice that. You can practice that. I mean, you can practice it by play along with pop music, mm -hmm. you, you know, with, with those kind of productions and be aware of it. Uh, but it definitely, there is much less freedom, really. There's so much less freedom, if you like, when you mm. think about it, you know? Yeah, I've uh, noticed it in the stuff that I've had to do. Where I end up removing fills and just not doing the things that we're taught to do as drummers or instinct will tell you to do. It just sounds yeah, weird. You, you, yeah, it sounds, I agree with you. I agree with you. And... uh it's just something that at the very beginning, I can't even recall because that's many years ago, but at the beginning, your instinct is to fight it, mm. which doesn't make sense because um, you can say from my generation, you know, there, it's, it's all different thing by being a young teenager, st studying with a great drum teacher. You learn how to play the instrument. You're all about the instrument. You know, mm -hmm. you listen to um if you listen to all the greatest legendary drummers um but then you you grow up and music changes and everything is everything is different you and then you realize wait a second that's great to know i mean when i play with a bunch of guys yeah that's the way i approach my instrument but now i'm playing with a bunch of machines right yeah are you literally playing with machines? And that's not something we studied with our drum teachers at the time mm -hmm. because they did not play with machines. John Bonham didn't play with machines. Right. <laughs> Buddy Rich didn't play with machines. Tony Williams did not play with machines. You know, uh, Ringo Starr did not play with machines with the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah, there is just the for, Stuart Copeland, maybe would have been one of the first. That's a great question. I'm trying to see. I don't think if there was the first or there was a combination, I believe, with the Simmons drums. If we're going back to people like Bill Burford or bands like The Cure, you know, I think that was a kind of a transition, you know, and. Um, it's interesting because I've listened to, um, believe early eighties or, you know, go listen to Brian Ferry, Roxy music when they had some drum machines, but then was complete live drums over there. And it, it's, uh, it's unbelievable how good it sounds still amazing. But you can tell when you listen, I wish I would know how many takes took them to right. you, you know what i mean <laughs> because that's long before you can take the backbeat of the drummer and put it 
on the grid with, you know, whatever sound you're using and uh, stuff like that. Um, so did you practice with drum machines at some point or how did you get to that point where it just became natural? You know, it's not like I even practiced. It just was a, a progress. It just, I remember when I lived in New York, there were more, at one point, more and more sessions that evolved with programming and let's call, I mean, drum machines in this case. It's not even drum machine, you know, it's Pro Tools and um, stuff like that. And I remember making notes for myself. It's like, always felt like I remember when I can recall like a particular scenarios, but it always felt like you hear the song in the control room, a producer play you the song or, or whatever, and you get an idea and then you go to the live room and you start tuning, warm up, and you start playing for the engineer to get the drum sound. So you stay in the same ballpark of the song you've heard but then all of a sudden they press record and all those elements coming at you. Now, guitars, bass, vocals, all that stuff, it's cool. But when those very cold, I call it like very cold, 127 velocity samples kicking in, all of a sudden you like, whoa, what just happened? You know, you you breathe differently. You're all your all approach become different. So I think it was just years of experimenting and, and experience with those different scenarios where it's like, okay, I need to, I need to get used to, I need to get used to that. And, um, but if you want to practice that, the only tip I have, I think we talk about it many times before, even, you know, play along with the song, play along with a pop song that doesn't have any live drums. Record yourself, listen back, see how consistent you are. Doesn't matter if you have one microphone, you know, just play it, stay in the same groove, just groove with the song and listen back and be very objective about it. You know, how consistent is my backbeat? How consistent is my bass drum? But then, and you move to the next stage. You move to the next stage of be aware of your physical ability. You know, we all different. There's some really big, strong guys who can hit it 127, no problem, Z, A to Z. Um, well, and am I at the shape where I can hit 127 consistently from A to Z or I'm going to, you know, fall off the cliff as we, you know, get to the end of the song. So uh, it just honesty, trust your ears and, and, and I guess practice really, you know, That's and believe great. me, I hate it as well. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, if you're going to work, you gotta be able to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah, you do. So, last question. Thank you. This has been great. Um, I'm asking everyone because the first season is my first snare drum. So, what was your first snare drum back in Israel oh. when you first started? Oh my God, I'm trying to remember. That was a uh... man. My father got me this uh, Vista Light kit. It was like a a local rip off of something it was like a yellow vista light kit and then the matching snare was a vista light and it sounded like a shoebox <laughs> no doubt. and I, I know i mean i remember trying as a kid as a young teenager i couldn't even tell you what this drum was i could not tell you what this drum was um and you know, now when you're asking me, I cannot even remember. Oh, I'll tell you what was my, um, and then I was like a real snare drum. 
And between you and I, even though I play Sono, that's the, if there is one drum set that I regret that I ever sold, one, it was the Yamaha, the real Yamaha 9000. Oh, the classic no, yeah, Steve yeah. Gadd. Yeah. Uh, we're talking, God, 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 how many years ago? So I can't even tell you. I saved a lot of money and my father helped me and I bought this drum set. Um, man, we must be talking 35 years or something. I don't know. Can you imagine this drum set? Did it have a matching snare? No, it had a met, uh, uh, comb over brass snare. Okay. Yeah. But man, you must know. You might, I know you know. If I mean, I can actually see the snare, but I cannot tell you what they call it. Yeah, did it have like beads in the like four yes. lines or something? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. So that was your but first like real snare. That was like the real, real snare that I remember when I got the drum set. I mean, I probably I was the happiest kid on earth. I don't think there was any kid who was as happy as I was in that day. And I remember playing this, especially the snare drum. It was, you know, it's almost like a kid. Have you ever watched a young kid or a baby kid who get to taste ice cream for the first time? Okay. You know, they're always fainting out. It was just like, I always remember it with my daughter, like the first time she had ice cream. I saw she's about to faint out. <laughs> I mean, you know, and uh, that's this is what it felt like, you know, because that's that's what I was looking for. That's a real snow drum, you know, uh, from this kind of vista light, but a really piece of crap that, like, you literally could use a shoebox and it would, you know, sound the same, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's part of the journey, man. You know, it's pretty amazing because these days it's like even the cheap drums, what they call cheap, you know, all the, they all sound good. Yeah, it's hard to find a bad drum anymore. It really is, you know, yeah. it's like they're all making good drums. So it's like, um, yeah, most kids out there, I believe, when they get their first drum kit, they get to hear a snare drum, which sounds like a snare drum, mm -hmm. you know, so. Cool, That's man. pretty much it. Thank you so much. So I look forward to seeing you next weekend in person at the Music City yeah. Drum Show. See yeah. what happens. Uh, First clinic for probably anyone in a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Better so no be... pressure. I think it's going to be... No, uh... no pressure at all. Yeah. <laughs> there is no pressure when you need to play in front of other drummers. I know. This is so unnatural. I know. You know, there is so unnatural. You know, I have... Uh, yeah, it's like I have a friend in New York. She's uh, she's a psychotherapist, and uh, we friends for years. And you know, we talk, and it's like she goes, "What's the big deal? So you're going to play? You play a show? You play a clinic? Or you play?" I said, oh, "Well, it's exact same thing. If you were on stage in front of two hundred or one hundred psychotherapists, <laughs> you know, and you share with them your theory, so how does it feel?" And then she goes. Oh, okay. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I look at uh, it like we're all just finally able to hang out, and that's what. Oh yeah, you yeah, can just no. play the hang. Billie Jean beat for an hour. I think we'll be cool. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we're gonna we're gonna hang. That's for sure, man. All right. Well, thank you so much, and then you're welcome. But always, always pleasure. Anyone listening, if you're in Nashville area next weekend, that is August eighth, seventh. 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 I think seventh. It's yeah. All day long. There's three clinics. I'll be the afternoon at one. Near you're at four, I believe. I think four. Four. And Brian Quick is kicking it off in the beginning. So I think it's five bucks to get in. It's kind of a no brainer if you want to come hang out. And that's it, man. So again, thanks, awesome. Nir. And uh, yeah, we'll. Thank you, buddy. We'll do this again. I didn't even ask half my questions. So <laughs> next I'm time. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But next time. I just got into the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's only drums yeah it's yeah. only music you know all right thank you so much thanks buddy we'll talk later on
Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Near Z. And if you are in Nashville or the Nashville area, or within a few hours drive of Nashville, Near and I are both going to be at the Music City Drum Show on August 7th. That is next Saturday. I am giving a presentation or playing some drums basically at one o'clock. And Near goes on at four. And the show is actually opening with Brian Quick at 11. It's an all day event. Tons of uh, custom and boutique companies are going to be there. A few of the major companies are going to be there. It'll be nice to see everybody. So if you're in the area, come down, say hello, um, and then we'll see you. We'll be back on our regular schedule next week. We've got um, Justin Faulkner of the Brand for Marsalis Quartet. So see you then, and hopefully see some of you in Nashville. <laughs>